Well, um, welcome back again. Thank you for coming again. Our last um, video, uh, video number two, we talked about how sensitive people can be and the difference for sensitivities uh, seem to be um, that they had fear, stress, and anxiety. And this fear, stress, and anxiety actually increased um, their sensitivity to um, different chemicals. It uh, gave them allergies and also impaired their body's ability to um, excrete all chemicals including xenoestrogens. And so um, we'd like to talk about um, why our product is different and it's a, a shameless plug I guess for a product. That's how I uh, make my living. And the question is, uh, why is our product Progestel different? Well, uh, let me just explain um, how we started to uh, make this product back in 1999 um, and compare our product to everything else. So basically, if you compare it to our other competitors, um, what, is a, what is a cream? Basically, a cream is just uh, oil and water mixed together. And of course, oil and water don't mix, so you have to put in an emulsifier um, with uh, that oil and water to keep them mixed together. And this emulsifier, um, you actually have to uh, put in a thickener after that. And because you have water in it, you have to put a preservative in it. And frequently, um, these preservatives are also um, estrogenic. So um, one example of an estrogenic preservative would be parabens. Another example would be phenoxyethanol. And frequently, um, a lot of the uh, herbs that are put into these creams are um, estrogenic as well. So let me give you an example. I started uh, making a progesterone cream in 1999 and I had um, read John Lee's book What Your Doctor May Not Tell You About Menopause by John Lee MD. He's a Norwegian fellow, family practice, graduated from Harvard undergraduate. I believe he went to University of Minnesota or Michigan. I can't remember. I think it was Minnesota. And uh, as for medical school, and he practiced family practice medicine in Sevastopol, California for about 30 years. And so I read his book, What Your Doctor May Not Tell You About Menopause, and I suggest you should read it too. It, even though it says menopause, it contains very useful information on endometriosis, PMS, uh, ovarian cysts, fibroids. And so my mother was 70 years old. In 1999, she had a fibroid the size of a softball, and she was taking synthetic estrogen. And I um, was talking to her, and her um, class, her uh, her physician wanted to do a hysterectomy. And I read John Lee's book, and he said, "Well, you just give him progesterone, and um, hey, the fibroid goes away." So I read John Lee's book, and I uh, took a progesterone cream out of John Lee's book from um, his pages. And the first cream I gave her had sage and rosemary in it. So um, I gave my uh, mother this progesterone cream. And um, she called me back after a month. I took her off the synthetic estrogen. And really, if I had taken her off the synthetic estrogen alone, perhaps, uh, she, the fiber would have disappeared. So I took her off the synthetic estrogen that she was on. And I gave her this uh, progesterone cream off the shelf from John Lee's book. And she calls me up after a month. And she says, my fibroid's bigger now. So I checked the label, I started talking to the um, company, read their information, and I found, and I asked them, well, why is there sage and rosemary in this progesterone cream? And they said, well, we put sage and rosemary in the progesterone cream because um, they're phytoestrogens, phytoestrogens. And I said, phytoestrogens, what are those? And they said, well, those are plant estrogens, or plants that mimic estrogen. We put it in there for hot flashes. So I said, well, I'm trying to get rid of her fibroid. You know, I don't want to do that. So I, I got a second cream from John Lee's book, and um, I gave this to my mother again. And um, in about three months, her fibroid shrank down to nothing, and she was normal. And so she didn't have to have a hysterectomy. And so I began to um, look at the ingredients in this cream, and went to go visit my brother down in Austin, Texas, and went to University of Texas. Um, um, database, their old database, started looking up the uh, material safety and data sheet, the MSDS data sheets on all the chemicals in this cream. And it turned out that this particular uh, progesterone cream had stereoconium chloride in it. And stereoconium chloride is a preservative and it actually acts as an emulsifier as well. And it says that 3 cc's or 3 ml's taken orally causes fatal convulsions in adults. So I asked the question, well, how much stereoconium chloride is in this 
second progesterone cream. And it turns out that if she ate a third of the bottle of the progesterone cream, she would die of fatal convulsions. And so I was fairly upset with this. And, um, and she was putting the progesterone cream on her skin. And, um, it, it, you know, she's getting a dose of sterocodium chloride. So then I began to look at a whole bunch of other creams, progesterone creams and lotions and shampoos and um, both in, in the department store and in the uh, health food store. And I found out that most of the lotions, shampoos, creams, even progesterone creams, either has some kind of toxic component in it or has some um, kind of herb that's estrogenic or preservative the estrogenic. So um, I spent a year um, trying to make a cream because I had started to give these progesterone creams to my patients, and my endometriosis patients would complain. They say they called me up and say, "Hey, doc, you know, uh, I used the progesterone cream. Now I'm worse." Okay, so I called up John Lee, uh, MD, before he passed away, and he graciously took my phone call in California. Passed away, and I think in 2003. I don't know if that's cr completely correct, but I think it's 2003. But I called him up and I said. Um, well, I, you know, the safest thing I can figure out to make a progesterone cream it, to keep the oil and water mixed together is um, soy lecithin because, you know, they use soy lecithin in chocolate and that's the safest thing I can find to keep the oil and water mixed together. And John Lee said, soy lecithin, I would never use that. And so, well, I guess that wasn't such a good idea. And so I, 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 I didn't know how to make a cream. This is after a year. I, I, I didn't know how to make one. Because I, I couldn't find anything that's not toxic or anything that um, uh, didn't have uh, some kind of xenoestrogen effect. And so um, I was kind of stymied. Um, and so then I called up um, Zava PhD, who um, does the saliva hormone testing for John Lee. And I said, I can't find a progesterone cream that I like because a lot of these progesterone creams are making my patients worse. And so, uh, you know, what do I do? And John and Zava said, just put it in coconut oil. So that's our product. We just put USP, uh, natural progesterone, that's pharmaceutical grade, uh, into the coconut oil. And it's third party tested by an analytical lab for purity and potency. And that's all it is. And so um, I, I don't know how to make a progesterone cream. And, um, and then the second question is, if sage and rosemary in the progesterone cream can actually make your fibroid bigger and worse, then what else on the skin can make whatever thing that you're dealing with worse? So um, let's talk about the different kinds of hormone disruption. And um, it's not just... The most common kind of hormone disruption is, of course, the chemical will mimic estrogen. Uh, but there are other kinds of hormone disruption as well. So according to a Brigham Young University study, several cups of coffee per day increases your own estradiol by 70%. So again, um, instead of doing a saliva test or blood test, uh, hormone test, I'll ask the, the woman or my patient, uh, do they drink coffee? And if they drink coffee, then you do the estradiol test, and the estradiol will be increased. So if you did a hormone test on yourself and your estradiol is increased, the question that you must ask is why. So coffee is one of those natural chemicals that will cause an increase in estradiol. And there are several others. Um, some chemicals actually mimic estrogen. For instance, atrazine, which is a common weed killer, feminizes frogs. So they're finding frogs that are intersex, half male, half female. And they found out that it was atrazine. They added atrazine to the frogs and the little tadpoles, and they grew up looking half male and half female. And in some places, the frog population is going down because of that. Some chemicals, even natural chemicals, um, such as lavender tea trail, um, as we talked about in um, lecture one, uh, lavender tea trail will mimic estrogen and actually block testosterone. So this is an example where something is organic and natural. Organic just means no pesticide, uh, no um, synthetic fertilizers. Okay, But lavender and tea trail, if, if they're grown in a pristine environment, they will still mimic estrogen and block testosterone. And in our example, in our first video, if you want to go look at it again, um, it caused man boobs and young boys. 
some chemicals can actually block testosterone, pro progesterone. And so um, one example of this is aloe vera. So in some cultures, if you do not want your pregnancy, you want to cause a miscarriage, you have too many children, you do not want a, a, a child. And I, I don't agree with that philosophy, by the way. Personally, this is just a prototypical example. Um, but aloe vera in those cultures is used to create a first trimester miscarriage. So during the first trimester, if you take enough, drink enough aloe and take enough aloe, this will cause a miscarriage. And so if you're trying to get pregnant, um, I would not use any products that contain aloe vera on your skin. So what is estrogen dominance? Um, I guess we've kind of skipped over that topic, but let's talk about that now. Um, estrogen dominance is a, a term coined by John Lee, and uh, this simply means too much estrogen. And it means, and this could be strange estrogens as well, these xenoestrogens. And so, um, what is it characterized with? And so we'll just go over some of the um, the symptoms of estrogen dominance. Um, but some of the symptoms are bloating, breast tenderness, weight gain, and sore breasts, especially just before the period. And some mainstream medical doctors, MDs, call this periodic water retention, and they give them Lasix. Um, but the real reason is that they're getting these re weird estrogens, xenoestrogens, in their environment, which causes bloating, breast tenderness, weight gain, sore breast just before the period. Um, it will cause, actually, a sugar craving. And uh, we'll talk about the thyroid hormone a little later, um, which helps cause the sugar craving. And it's not, so it's not just kind of a, um, an urge that you have to control. This is actually a biochemical um, uh, unbalancing that causes a sugar craving. Um, chocolate craving can come just before your period. Um, chocolate is one of the highest foods in magnesium and again estrogen dominance and these xenoestrogens can cause a magnesium deficiency. And so what will happen is um, you'll have a chocolate craving just before your period and that is key to a magnesium deficiency. A magnesium deficiency leads to muscle tensing, and so where do you get muscle tensing? Well, you'll have constipation because the muscles in your intestine will kind of tense up, and you'll have constipation. You'll have a charley horse or tensing of the leg muscles. Uh, you can have a tensing of the, the muscles around your arteries, and the arteries will become smaller naturally, and um, therefore the, the hole will become smaller in your arteries, and you can't have as much blood to your feet and hands, and then you'll have cold hands and cold feet. Uh, you'll, when magnesium goes low, you'll have calcium deposits, leading to microcalcifications in the breast, or um, bone spurs, um, you know, uh, which when calcium deposits on the tendon insertion, uh, when the tendon inserts on the bone. You can also have leg tensing, which some people call restless leg syndrome. Um, also, you can get a vitamin B deficiency, which is a neuropathy or nerve disease. And you find this creepy crawling feeling on your legs or a burning sensation on your legs. And this is termed as restless leg syndrome. Uh, also, what will happen is that um, it'll look hypothyroid. So hypothyroid means that your hair will start to fall out or thin. You have thin eyebrows. You may measure your body temperature as 97, where it should be 98.6, but it's 97 point something or 96 point something. And um, what happens is that you go to take your thyroid blood test, and the thyroid blood test is normal. So it's not that the, th the circulating thyroid hormones are abnormal or low. It is the thyroid receptor that has become sleepy and you're less sensitive to your own thyroid hormone. And so many times um, people just feel lethargic. They feel cold because of the hypothyroid. Uh, they might feel actually foggy thinking. Uh, they may have uh, um, falling out hair, thinning hair. Um, they may just feel um, lousy. They may actually have weight gain around their, their belly, fat, and hips. And so this is because the thyroid hormone receptor has become less sensitive. Okay, so um, now um, we're going to talk about iodine deficiency. And on our next uh, uh, slide, um, our next set of slides, iodine deficiency. And we'll talk about why that is important in these estrogen dominant diseases. So again, thank you for joining us. This is Dr. Eckhart with Women's Therapeutic Institute for Natural Progesterone Prodistel, and we'll see you again on the next slide.